one who's worked so hard to put all this together. Um, you'll probably be quite pleased to hear I'm not going to be as antagonistic as Kenny, <laughs> or provocative to use his word, um, but I will be raising some uh, key points that I think are applicable beyond the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age period um, and some questions that we do need to be thinking about more broadly in uh, developing this framework. Accepting the um, we, we have to accept the time periods that uh, are historically confining us. And as Kenny's already mentioned, we perhaps should be thinking about how we can bridge some of these transitional periods so it, things don't just start with the Chalcolithic. They obviously continue with things that began in the Neolithic. And equally, at the end of the Late Bronze Age, people don't just stop being Late Bronze Age and start being Iron Age. Um, accepting uh, this, we still need these sorts of structures at least a little bit in order to um, in order to direct our focus and think about some of these ideas in a fairly um, manageable scope. So some of the ideas I'm going to present are going to be falling within the Chalcolithic or within the Early Bronze Age, but we should also be thinking about how these fit into the longer temporal span. And as Kenny's already mentioned, several of the sites, uh, or indeed most sites, don't just display evidence of one period. It's a far longer tradition that's going on in many of these places. Um, in terms of what defines the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age period in Perth and Kinross, as already mentioned, the geographic nature of this region makes it quite distinctive in terms of what we can get out of a research framework. It covers both upland and lowland areas, and that allows us to explore what's happening in these two different areas, compare and contrast them, and think about how we can explore the relationship of people living and interacting in these two areas in the past. So in the uplands, we have the preservation of extant stone structures. We can think about uh, standing stones, stone circles, uh, rock art, um, and so on, whilst in the lowland it's much more about the crop features and many of the extant structures that did, did exist in the lowlands have since been destroyed by agricultural work. So how can we think about exploring that further? Most, uh, most broadly, this is the first age of metal. This is when people begin to use copper, gold, bronze. Um, and we again see this juxtaposition between the upland and lowland areas in terms of the material culture record through metalwork. The lowland areas see much more, um, much more depositional action of single finds and hordes of metalwork, uh, particularly concentrated in, around, and along the Tay. The Tay uh, presents some of the most prolific metalwork deposition in Scotland and indeed is the river from which uh, is the um, most uh, abundant river in Scotland for producing, for producing fines. By contrast, in the uplands, we have very few chance discoveries of fines, of, of particularly metalwork, but also other forms of material culture. And we have to consider, does this represent a genuine difference in where people want to uh, bury their material? Perth and Kinross conforms with a lot of uh, central, uh, central and eastern Scotland in having a very prolific burial record. And part of this has been, um, part of this has benefited from the excavation bias um, that Kenny has already mentioned. Margaret Stewart has, of course, identified huge numbers of sites uh, throughout her various surveys, complementing what's been done by the Royal Commission and more recent agendas. And in Perth and Kinross, we see a huge diversity of burial practices going on. We see cairns of various forms, earthen cairns, rock, uh, stone cairns, as well as flat kiss cemeteries, and a whole variety of grave goods representing the full suite of what was in production, circulation, and use in the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age. And this broad and varied material culture is often indicating that Perth and Kinross didn't exist in isolation in this period, or indeed the preceding or succeeding periods. It was widely connected, it utilized its uh, great many river valleys, and uh, the material culture is one way that we can think about how this region was connected, how methods of exchange operated in the region, 
and how far flung these contacts were. In terms of where people were living, as will become clear throughout uh, my presentation, the settlement record is uh, patchy, particularly in the lowland, and, but we have abundant evidence of hut circles in the upland areas, and Perth and Kinross has this uh, distinctive tangential pair formation, which is these double hut circles with an enclosing wall. Some of them seem to indicate that there are appendage huts that are stuck on to the side. Some of these are Bronze Age, some of them are Iron Age, some of them are medieval. There's been very little investigation into these sorts of structures, despite them being a fairly regionally important, um, regionally important feature, and one that you don't get very many other places. In terms of stone monuments, we have the usual suite of, um, of stone structures, but we, uh, Perth and Kinross also has a fair number of four posters. These are arrangements of four standing stones in a quadrangle, potentially a circle, and Perth and Kinross has more of this type of monument than any other place in Scotland. I'm going to quickly run through uh, more specifically what makes, uh, what defines the individual periods that I'm dealing with today and some of the key sites uh, and discoveries that, that are important to Perth and Kim Ross and then I'm going to start flagging up some of the knowledge gaps, though some of which uh, I hope have started to become clear already. So the Chalcolithic, as already mentioned, it's the introduction of copper and gold working. We see continental forms of uh, funerary practices, pottery emerging, uh, most distinctively this idea of beaker culture, uh, these, uh, this new form of pottery made in a slightly different way, made in different forms, and quite distinctively different from the preceding grooved ware that we see in the late Neolithic. We see new monuments being constructed, often on top of previous monuments or, in, or integrating earlier monuments into new ones. And, and with all of this, we need to be thinking about new people that are coming into Perth and Kinross at this time. Recent ADNA evidence has shown that between the beginning of the Chalcolithic and the end of the Early Bronze Age, around 1500 BC, we see a 90% overhaul in the genetic makeup of people living in Britain at this time. This is not an argument for hordes of people coming in and wiping out the native populations. This is a, an argument for integration, the exchange of ideas, and, the, and a fundamental change in society. This has been shown elsewhere in Scotland. However, we, yet, we currently lack any ADNA evidence from Perth and Kinross, uh, from those buried in Perth and Kinross, that might contribute to this narrative on a much broader level. What we do have is uh, evidence of the international contacts that were, were going on in Perth and Kinross at this time. Sites like New Mill, the beaker that I showed you on the previous slide, has been uh, is a uh, Dutch style of beaker. It represents the incoming of probably an immigrant, a Dutch immigrant, who brought a certain way of making pottery. We see uh, evidence of connections with Ireland in the metalwork, so metallurgical analysis of uh, early forms of weapons known as halberds, nothing like the later halberds, it's just very poor Bronze Age naming of objects. Um, but these halberds, when analysed, show that there, are, there is evidence of Irish metal and continental metal coming in. So metal that's being uh, transported and exchanged in and out of this region from both sides, coming in from the North Sea and also across central Scotland from the Irish Sea. And in, in terms of some of the distinctive monuments and sites from Perth and Kinross, we also have um, the Henge monuments at Forteviot and North Mains. And as Kenny has already indicated, it seems clear from radiocarbon dating that many of these Henge monuments we can no longer consider late Neolithic. They must be Chalcolithic or even early Bronze Age. In thinking about the early Bronze Age, this is when you get the first uh, bronze metallurgy proper, the alloying of tin and copper to make a bronze. Um, you get, you get your, the first prolific depositional activities happening at this time, so hordes of materials, single axes, 
Um, axes are by far the dominant thing deposited, and we can think about what makes an axe significant to, to uh, prehistoric populations. There's also a wide amount of ceramics in use, so beakers which developed very early on are very quickly um, replaced in Perth and Kinross by uh, things like food vessels, colloderns, cordoderns, a huge suite of different uh, ceramic styles. And whereas in places like Aberdeenshire, the beaker continues to be a fairly dominant pottery form, we don't see that same, um, that same trend in Perth and Kinross. So how, does that how do those two regions relate? And indeed, how does this re region relate to other surrounding regions where we might explore similar trends in material culture use. We have new monuments being built, but also the reuse of older monuments. North Main's Henge sees several successive phases um, of activity, the same at Fort Teviot, and the same at a whole host of other sites that um, we could list for days. And there's a whole diverse range of burial rites that I've already gone into, but also grave goods being buried at this time, which incorporate uh, new types of material that we haven't seen before, things like jet, amber, um, oh, the earliest gold object in Perth and Kim Ross comes from the early Bronze Age kist at uh, Fort Teviot. However, in amongst all of this uh, prolific evidence from this time, we have very little evidence of settlement. There's uh, a range of early Bronze Age settlements that have been identified south of the Forth. But, but as you go further north, and uh, there's very few that have so far been discovered and conclusively dated to this time, and certainly none that I know of in Perth and Kim Ross. When we think about key sites and discoveries from this time, we can think of uh, hordes like the Bumranak Axe Hoard, that was the wrong button, um, as well as uh, the recently published Kilmagadwood uh, Kist Cemetery, the second largest Kist Cemetery in, in all of Scotland. And this is a particularly important site because it incorporates that range of pottery that I mentioned. And we can really start to understand the, the types of um, traditions that were emerging at different times. The phasing on this site has been confirmed by a series of radiocarbon dates, though uh, there's still much more, to, much more work to be done on this site. Things like the Fortiviot burial are particularly distinctive. Uh, for instance, it's the first conclusive evidence of flowers associated with a burial in Bronze Age Britain. And then you've got important stone monuments like Moncrief. And all of this kind of comes together in distinctive burial and monumental landscapes that we can pick out across Perth and Kinross, which are key targets for future investigations. Things like Glen Shee, there's clusters all the way along the Tay Valley, and Loch Leven is, um, is increasingly showing evidence of clusters of sites. In terms of what we still don't know about this period, we still don't know where people are making metal. There's lots of uh, molds from this period up, up in Aberdeenshire, though there's, there's as yet no bronze working molds found from Perth and Kim Ross. As I've already mentioned, the settlement evidence is sparse. We could still do much more to understand where people are from, how they're getting into, how they're um, moving in and out of the region. We, we need to think about how we can interrogate the connections that Perth and Kim Ross has with other regions at this time. It's not enough to see it as a static, isolated region. It was widely connected, not just with the nearby modern counties, uh, modern authorities of Fife, Angus, Aberdeenshire, but also with continental Europe and further west in Scotland and Ireland. The Middle Bronze Age presents a very different picture from what I've, uh, I've just described. We see the continuation of bronze objects being produced, but there's far fewer hordes. This is the period where we see the first weapons being developed. Uh, the by this, I mean the first weapons for which you could do nothing other than stab someone with it. Um, a spear could be used for hunting, an axe can be used for chopping down a tree, but a sword is pretty much only good for stabbing someone else. And with, the, with these developments, we see uh, the first utilization of the Tay as a depositional center for metalwork. Early, 
early Bronze Age stone objects and Neolithic stone objects have been recovered from the Tay, but the deposition of weapons in the River Tay starts a tradition that continues uh, for uh, several millennia. We, by contrast with the diverse range of ceramics that occurred in the early Bronze Age, it becomes much more homogenized with these uh, unimaginatively plain rimmed urns, which do what they say on the tin. On the tin. And we see very, very, uh, very little diversification from this conventional form, which is just used to bury people, it's used for eating, it's used for drinking. And this fits into the broader picture of Scotland generally. What we do see by contrast is a diverse range of settlement practices emerging from about 1800 BC onwards. So we see uh, a huge number of, of uh, different types of sites emerging in the uplands. I've already mentioned the stone hut circles, but in the lowlands um, you get timber structures, ring groove structures, and so on. Key sites and discoveries. I want to flag particularly the Friot and Dirk, which you saw on the previous page. It's the earliest, uh, earliest metalwork deposition in the Tay, but it's also been the subject of experimental archaeology. Replicas have been made and it's been tested against synthetic skeletal material to test the effectiveness of the weapon at this time. And this is particularly important because it's the first example that I know of, of this um, sort of experiment being done with this type of weapon. Other experiments have been done with swords and spears, but this is something that Perth and Kinross can really contribute um, by, in exploring further how we understand these objects. Things like uh, the re-excavation of Croft Moig has also shaped our understanding of, of uh, earlier monuments. Richard Bradley's excavation here identified that what was previously considered a much earlier timber structure was actually a Middle Bronze Age structure built inside an earlier stone circle, and that has wide implications for how we be, should be thinking about historic excavations and unpublished reports and whether we should be taking them at face value or whether these can be targets for the future to be reinvestigated and re-examined in light of modern techniques and modern analyses. And we again get, um, we, we again get areas of concentrated activity, particularly along the strats and in the uplands and these can be identified on things like the Royal Commissions and again may prove viable targets for future research aims. The Late Bronze Age continues very much what began in the, in the Middle Bronze Age. We, we see huge amounts of hoarding and depositional practice being undertaken. The Tay becomes a very dominant focus, but we are also recognising through increased metal detecting activity other concentrations around Loch Leven and various other areas. And when we see uh, what we see in the material culture that's being recovered is again this, these uh, connections with areas further afield. So uh, objects like the vessel in the Corrymukluk hoard has uh, connections with uh, continental Europe and conforms more broadly to continental traditions that were occurring in Scotland at this time. Funerary practices become very ephemeral at this time. We know that people were being cremated we don't know where they're being buried. This, this is a broader issue across Bronze Age Britain, but uh, through radiocarbon dating on cremated remains at earlier monuments, what we're frequently seeing is that late Bronze Age cremated remains are being scattered at these earlier stone circles and henges. What does this mean about how people in the past thought about these earlier monuments and engaged with them? We, and, and by extension, this should lead us to think about what we know and don't know about settlement activity at the same time. Stone hut circles and lowland settlements, we still haven't exactly defined the character of these for this region. And, um, and yet we know that there are distinctive elements such as tangential pairs, which could be explored further. As a case in point, when Kandu was excavated, one of these tendential pairs was, was examined and it was found that it wasn't actually a contemporary pair. It was a late Bronze Age, it was a late Bronze Age hut circle that had a later Iron Age, early medieval structure attached to it. So we see this later reoccupation of earlier sites and the reuse of earlier structures. 
I've already mentioned uh, much of this, but uh, in particular, I should mention the Carpoo logboat as a, an incredibly distinctive part of what the research that Perth and Kim Ross has done in the past, um, but also the example of the way people may have been moving in, out, and around this region. And this is an internationally important find that um, the research that's been done on it shows what can be done in the future with these sorts of projects. In terms of what we don't know, uh, we still don't know the exact character of broader depositional actions. The uh, Carpu project ex was um, very good at expanding to think about what else was happening around the Tay Valley at this time, what sort of depositional trends were occurring. And this, this would be beneficial for other areas, or indeed the Polar Perth and Kinross, to get that sense of what people were doing where and how. Um, I've already mentioned repeatedly the connections Perth and Kinross has at this time with other regions, but also we need to be thinking about how and why earlier monuments were used and uh, how can we refine our understanding of settlement practices. I'm going to finish now by thinking about some suggested priorities for the future. Uh, I offer the same caveat as Kenny. These are my own thoughts on where we might go next. These are by no means uh, the uh, final word on the subject, and I'd, I'm very much open and looking forward to contributions from those of you that will be in the think tank workshop later. We need to think about how we approach these transitional periods. What does it um, what does it mean to uh, define a period by the fact that metal suddenly emerges or iron, or iron suddenly becomes the fashionable uh, metal in use? Um, I think these have the potential to be beneficial, but uh, as it currently stands, there's the potential that they will also restrict us, the current chronological uh, definitions. And I echo Kenny's sentiment that there would be some benefit in thinking about the third millennium as a whole and this spread between the, the late Neolithic through to the early Bronze Age. What, are the what can the time depth of certain areas and monuments tell us about relationships between people and places? What does it mean when we con constantly find evidence of occupation in certain areas, starting in the Neolithic, reoccupied 100 years later, reoccupied, 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 all the way through to the Iron Age, early medieval, and ev even the modern times? What is it about these places that draws people? How can we think about memory in the past? How do these places retain their significance? And uh, one, one area that I wanted to flag is the Loch Leven in, environs, where uh, Kilma, the Kilmagab Wood Cemetery that I mentioned is on the brink of this. This is also where the earliest metalwork in um, Perth and Kinross has been found. It's also where the earliest metalwork in Fife, it, it, um, it's right next to where the earliest metalwork in Fife has been found. It's also where we have um, late Bronze Age metalwork depositions and indeed Iron Age and Roman Iron Age depositions as well. So there's clearly a focal point around Loch Leven in terms of burial and depositional practices that could do with further exploration in the future. Um, and many of these points I've mentioned throughout, the, uh, throughout my presentation. And as I've mentioned already, these are just ideas to jump off from. Um, I'm open to anything you think I've quite blatantly missed. Um, and I welcome your comments later in the think tank. Oh, uh, I should also mention that in doing this project, it became abundantly clear it would be very easy to develop research priorities if we had a synthesis of this period. Um, none, no synthesis of this uh, period in this region has ever been written, and this would certainly benefit how we can move forward and how we can develop ideas for the future in identifying genuine knowledge gaps rather than just biases in what's been done previously. Thank you very much.